you would bow your heads as we unite our hearts in prayer. Holy and gracious God, as the mist falls down, may your spirit fall down among us. Open our ears so that we may hear. Open our minds so that we may understand. And open our hearts so that we could experience your love and grace. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I was thinking about coming back this morning, and one of the thoughts that struck me that was really hard for me to wrap my mind around this morning is the fact that my daughter Tori is a junior in college. I mean, she took her first steps with you, Amanda, and she's a junior in college. And I say this because she got her educational start here at the Epworth Children's Center. And while she was in kindergarten here, I remember Michelle and I having conversations about what were we going to do for first grade and beyond? Would we look at public schools? Would we look at private schools? What did we want to do? And so we decided we would look at both. And one of the schools that was on our list was the Calvert School because Michelle had a good friend who was on the board at the Calvert School and she was kind of nudging us in that direction. And I remember the admissions interview. Now, my daughter was five. She had an admissions interview at the Calvert School and spent some time with the admissions counselor by herself while Michelle and I sat in the library. And then when her interview was over, we came in and sat down with the admissions counselor and with Tori. And the first question or statement out of the admissions counselor's um, mouth was, so tell us about Tori's older sister. I looked at Michelle, and Michelle looked at me, and we both looked confused, and we explained to the admissions counselor, um, Tori's an only child. She doesn't have any siblings. She doesn't have any younger siblings. She doesn't have any older siblings. Um, so why did you think Tori had a sister? And the admissions counselor began to say, well, apparently, Tori was telling me about her big sister named Anna and had this long conversation about her big sister named Anna. So we had to explain to the admissions counselor that Anna McGuckin was not her big sister, just a friend who watched her at church. And that's just a simple reminder for those who are parents know this. You never know as a parent what type of questions you're going to get asked, what type of situations you're going to face, what type of obstacles you're going to need to overcome. And there are times when people wonder if the Bible is still relevant today. There are times when people wonder if the Bible still has something to say to modern culture. And then we come across a story like the one we're going to hear this morning that's rooted in daily life. It's a story about a suffering child and a concerned parent and an awestruck crowd and a group of faithful disciples and another group of their opponents. And it all begins with a father's tentative prayer. If you're able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. And it ends with the statement of the ages, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. So let's listen to the entire passage. It's found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw Jesus, they were immediately overcome with awe and they ran forward to greet him. Jesus asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak and whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. Jesus answered them, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to Jesus. When the spirit saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled out, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. 
Jesus said to him, If you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. When he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, this kind can only come out through prayer. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So today we're exploring part three of a sermon series on healing. So far you've explored the healing of the body and the healing of the mind, and today is about healing of the soul. And, and to, begin, to, to begin, let's differentiate a little bit between the healing of the soul and the healing of the mind. So I was here last week when Pastor Terry talked about uh, healing of the mind and her whole understanding, or at least what I got out of it, was she was dealing with the mental health issues that many of us deal with on a daily basis, and most of which are related to the events happening around us and the effect that takes on our psyche. And she really shone a light on our struggles that we have with stress and anxiety and depression and the whole idea that we really should be talking about these things and not hiding them away. But this understanding of healing of the soul really deals with spiritual dis-ease. Not disease, but spiritual dis-ease. That crisis of faith when we lose sight of God during times of doubt or fear or dis disobedience. Now before we get to the story at hand, it's really helpful to get at the story that comes before the story. From Mark, the beginning of Mark in chapter 9, the story that's right before this, Mark records the transfiguration. That is the story where Jesus goes up onto the mountainside with Peter, James, and John to commune with them. And while they're standing on the mountainside, Jesus is... Uh, figure changes and transforms and begins to glow and shine like the sun and the disciples see standing with Jesus Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets and they hear the voice of God saying this is my son the beloved with whom I'm well pleased. I mean this is the definition of a mountaintop experience. I mean, if you've ever been away on a mission trip or on a retreat and you've just had that experience where you have felt tangibly the presence of God and you want it to last forever because you've had this mountaintop experience, it all goes back to this. As we try to describe what would it be like to be on a mountain with Jesus and the other giants of the faith. And when I think about that experience, I think, you know, if I had that kind of experience, it would be easy to have faith. It would be easy to have faith if Jesus appeared in all of his glory and stood before us. It would be easy to have faith if we, like Elijah from our earlier story, had God providing overtly for our material needs. It would be easy to have faith if, like Elijah, God spoke to us in an audible, still, small voice. I mean, if that was the case, none of us would need to cry out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. If that was the case, there would be no doubt, there would be no unbelief, there would just be you and God and Jesus just hanging out, singing kumbaya, having a good time. But what happened on that mountaintop is not the whole story. While Peter, James, and John were experiencing the presence of God with Jesus, while Peter, James, and John were hearing God's audible voice, while Peter, James, and John were seeing the other giants of the faith, the other disciples were down at the base of the mountain, and they were finding themselves in a mess. Here's a group of people who Jesus gave the authority to cast out demons and spirits, and yet when confronted with one, they could not claim that authority. They could not cast out the boy's demon. So this story that we encounter today is another healing story like 
the last two Sundays. We heard about the healing of blind Bartimaeus and the healing of the man who was possessed by the demon Legion. And now we see a father who brings his son with something like epilepsy before the disciples. But really, this story is not about the son's affliction. The story is not about the demon to be cast out. The story that's beneath the story is a story of a father's honesty. It's a story about a father who wasn't playing games with Jesus. He didn't try to say the right religious words so that he appeared to have more faith than he actually did. This is a story about a man who simply stated where he was in that moment. I believe, help my unbelief. It's a story about a man who didn't understand what was happening and he didn't have everything together. He was just coming before Jesus with who he was in that moment. And it wasn't that the father didn't believe in Jesus. I mean, he had heard the stories of how Jesus had healed other people, so he had some foundation of belief because he brought his child to Jesus thinking that Jesus would heal him. This was just an admission that he didn't know how to have faith in the midst of this trial. This was an admission that sometimes all we have at our disposal is a watered-down maybe. That all we have to offer Jesus at best at times is the truth that we want to believe. We just don't know how because right now it seems that our world is falling apart and we can't fix it. In this story, the father is experiencing what we call a dark night of the soul. It's a term that goes back to a poem that was written by St. John of the Cross in the 16th century. Some describe this experience of the dark night of the soul as a deep sense of meaninglessness. Some describe it as a chasm that we create between ourselves and God through doubt. Others describe it as are losing a sense of God's presence over an extended period of time. And if you have ever felt that way, you're not alone. In 2016, when Pope Francis canonized Mother Teresa, he was honoring a nun who won admiration from people around the world. He was honoring a nun who won a Nobel Peace Prize for her joy-filled dedication to the poor. He was also recognizing the holiness of a woman who felt so abandoned by God that she admits at times she was unable to pray. And despite her ever-present smile, at times she was convinced that she was experiencing the tortures of hell. This all came out in a book that was her published letters that she had written between her confessor and herself. And for nearly 50 years, she was experiencing this dark night of the soul, a, a period of spiritual doubt, a time of despair and loneliness. But she never let those feelings get in the way of her calling. She believed, but there were periods of her life that she needed Jesus' help for her unbelief. Or even in our own tradition, you may be familiar with a gentleman by the name of John Wesley. Anyone? Okay, good. If not, he founded the entire Methodist movement. And he himself experienced a dark night of the soul, raised in a Christian household, the son of a pastor, a pastor himself. He felt this calling to leave England and come to the colonies to Georgia so he could preach to what he called the prisoners and the heathen savages. And his first experience of a dark night of the soul came as he was traveling by ship across the Atlantic and a storm picked up and he was in panic, and others were in panic, and there was this small group of men and women and children all huddled kind of in a corner of the deck, and they were not panicked. They were singing hymns and saying prayers and just seemed calm, and John went over to this group of Moravian Christians and just admired their faith in the midst of turmoil. 
And then when he got to the colonies, nothing went according to his plan. The Native Americans would not listen to him. He had a salacious affair with a young lady in the town to the degree that when she would not return his affections, he banned her from receiving communion. I don't know, Mark, is that a thing we get to do? Because I got a list. No, it was not a thing we get to do, but he banned her from taking communion, and as a result, they ran him out of town on a rail. And on the voyage back, he was despondent, he was depressed, he was feeling the absence of God and ready to just call it quits. When another Moravian, Peter Bowl, Bowler, came and sat with him through the voyage and ministered to him and, and taught him this little phrase that John Wesley carried with him for the rest of his life, to preach faith until you have it, and when you have faith, preach it. I guess a modern day equivalence would be fake it till you make it. In other words, even when you doubt the presence of God, God is still there, so proclaim it until you feel it. And that's how we overcome doubt, by embracing it, by crying out for a soul healing, by crying out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, by acknowledging our spiritual struggles, and we all have them. As a clergy person, I, I hear them all the time. Lord, I want to trust that I will see my husband again, but... Lord, I see the fires raging in the west and the floodwaters rising in the east. I want to trust you, but I wonder where are you? Lord, I fear this pandemic may not end. Lord, I'm weary of riots and fearful of the nation's divisions. God, if you will heal my child, I will believe. And the list goes on and on and on. And for some reason, we as Christians have bought into this lie that we need to amass this ginormous amount of faith in order to survive this world when Jesus tells us the opposite. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus reminds us how much faith we really need to have when he says, for truly I tell you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So do a little exercise with me. Take out your hand and hold your fingers about this far apart and just slowly squeeze them together until they just about touch but aren't touching. As close as you can get one finger from the other without touching, that's the size of a mustard seed. So all you really need to have in your entire being is able to scrounge up that minuscule amount of faith. So in a moment, we are going to be recommissioning Anna and her husband, Nathan the Glens. I still can't get over calling you the Glens. And I came across a story that reminded me of the two of you. It's about Dr. John Patton. He was a missionary in Australia. Actually, he was a missionary in one of the islands off of Australia. And he wanted to translate the Gospel of John into the language of the Aboriginal people. And as he was working through that language, he discovered that in their native language, there was no word for believe. It just didn't exist in that language. And that was a problem, because if you want to translate the Gospel of John, you need to have a word for believe, because believe appears 90 times in the Gospel, and much of it hinges on that. So Dr. Patton, realizing that there was no word, he gave up on translating, put his manuscript aside. It was a lost cause. Now, sometimes later, he was sitting in his office, and a fellow co-worker came in. He was an aboriginal pastor who was out in the hills preaching to the local people, and he was dog-tired, and he sat down, just kind of plopped down in a chair, and he put his feet up in another chair, and then he said an aboriginal word that meant, I am resting my whole weight 
on these two chairs. One word which meant all of that. One word which meant I am placing my whole weight on these two chairs. And the light bulb went off for Dr. Patton. There was the word he, would, he could translate into believe. I am resting my whole weight. I am putting my complete trust. I am giving complete abandon. I am offered no other support. I am resting my whole weight upon Jesus. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen.